Okay, so uh, today we're going to learn about rates of change. We're also going to learn about average velocity. We're going to learn about relative change and concavity. So four major topics that we're going to cover today relatively quickly. We're still in the review portion of this class, so uh, we're going to go through kind of a lot of stuff today. And some of the examples we're not going to have time for, so I'm going to skip over them and come back to them later if we have time. Yes? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Is that better? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it okay if I leave the back ones on? Or you guys want them off? No. Okay, we're going to keep them on then. Okay, uh, so... By the end of class today, you'll know how to find the rate of change. You'll know how to find average velocity and determine whether a graph is concave up or concave down just by looking at it. Okay, these are going to be important concepts later on when we talk about derivatives and when we talk about the second derivative. Okay, so rate of change is going to correspond to the first derivative and concavity is going to correspond to the second derivative. Okay, no, that doesn't mean that much right now, but I just want to get that stuck in your mind early. So let's start on the warm-up problem. Let's have everybody try it. Uh, this is just a problem from last time. We're going to decide whether or not this thing is linear and why. Actually, it says that it's linear, so you're supposed to explain why. So go ahead and try that out on your own. Okay, let's go ahead and go through this together. We're going to do it like how we did it last time. Uh, we'll just go piece by piece. So we'll start here and we'll go here. I always like to go where x is increasing. Okay, so we go from negative 6 to negative 4. That's an increase of positive 2. And uh, so that was my run. What was my rise? Three. Negative 3. Negative three. The magnitude of my rise was 3, but rise is going to be measured as a signed unit, okay? So we're going to have negative 3, okay? Next one, we went over 2 again, and guess what? We went down 3, over 2, and then we went, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, over, hang on a second, we went over 2, And we went down by 6. So this is not linear. <laughs> okay, these two things are not equal, so this is not linear. Okay, well, that's some feedback that I need to give to the person who makes these. Okay, well, we found out that that's not actually linear. I, I suspect that this was supposed to be a jump of, uh, I suspect this was supposed to say 2 or something like that. And then it would be like 6 over 4. And then it would be linear from there. Yes, it would be linear from there. So that should have said 2. In that case, we would have had negative 6 over 4 
we'll finish out the problem as it should have been done. Next time we go over two, we go down three, and we go over two, down three, and we go over four, down six. And all these things are equal. So the change between any two points is consistent in terms of how far we moved over with our x value. So it's going to be linear. So it's linear. OK, minor hiccup there. All right, so now we're going to talk about average rate of change. So for a line, the rate of change is constant, right? We have just this graph here that looks like this. And we just go up at the same rate the whole time. That was the definition of a line. And that's what we just used to show that this set of data is, in fact, data that describes a line. So now we're going to talk about average rate of change, which applies to a more general class of functions. It can apply to functions which are, say, curvy in nature. Maybe they look like this. And we can describe the average rate of change between two points as the slope of the line which crosses between those two points. OK, that's how we're going to describe that. OK, so it's the slope of direct path from, I'm going to give two general points, a comma f of a, that's our first point, to b comma f of b. Okay, So in this case, a and b are inputs of our function. They're going to lie on our x-axis. So this could be a here, and this could be b. And f of a and f of b are going to denote the y values of the function at those points. Okay, And it's given by, let's see here, I'm going to write delta y over delta x. Okay, And don't be scared what this delta means is just delta means change in. Okay, So it's given by delta y over delta x. And the formula for each of those is going to be respectively f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And you'll notice this looks exactly like the slope formula which we came up with for lines in the last lecture. And that's because it is the slope of a line. It's the slope of this line which takes the direct path between two points on a function. OK. So let's try problem number one. I, I'll, I'll keep the definition up on there. So. We want to let g of x equal to x cubed minus 2x squared. And we have a graph of it down below. And uh, we want to draw a line segment between these two points where x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 3. So if x is equal to 0, remember x is on this horizontal axis. So that means that I should be right here. Okay. If I go to x equals 3, that's right here. So where's my point? It's going to be up here at 3 comma 9. Okay, so the two points that we have are 0 comma 0 and 3 comma 9. Okay. So we're now going to be asked to compute the average rate of change of f of x on this interval. Right here is our line segment. And we know that the average rate of change is just going to be the slope of this line. So in particular, we don't need to actually find the equation of this line, we only need to find one component of it, which is the slope. So we're going to do f of b minus f of a over b minus a, where in our case, this is a, b, uh, sorry, a and f of a, and this is uh, b comma f of b. So we're going to get 9 minus 0 over 3 minus 0 equals 3. So if we wanted to find the equation of, of the line of direct path, it would be given by y equals 3x. 
And I wouldn't add anything on the end because I can see that we're passing through the origin. So you can think of there being kind of like a plus zero out back, but we're not going to write that. Okay, have we answered the question? We found the average rate of change. What is the connection between the line segment and the average rate of change? Well, the average rate of change is the slope of this line segment. Okay, let's do problem number two. I'm going to try to speed up a little bit because I've been going kind of slow. So if I start going too fast, please just stop me and I'll, I'll slow down and go back, okay? All right. So we have this function now, g has changed. It's 1 over 16 x to the fourth minus x squared, which is graphed below. And we want to evaluate each of the following and interpret each as the average rate of change of g of x over some interval. OK, so let's just do this one first. So if I want to plug in g of 0, that just means I plug in 0 into this thing. So this is going to be all one big fraction. g of 0 is going to be 1 over 16 times 0 squared minus 0 squared. That's all equal to 0. Minus, and I'm going to put parentheses here because I want to subtract everything that is going to be g of negative 2. So I plug in negative 2, and what do I get? I get uh, 1 over 16 negative 2 to the fourth power. That's 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is going to be positive 16. So these guys are going to cancel and become 1. And we'll have a minus in here. And x squared is going to be just negative 2 squared, which is positive 4. But we got to remember that we're subtracting this number. OK. Divided by 0 minus negative 2, that's positive 2. So let's simplify. We have on the top 0 minus, we can simplify this entire inside thing as 1 minus 4. We can make it negative 3. So we want to take negative negative 3, that's positive 3, and divide it by 2. And that is our answer. So this figure here is the average rate of change on some interval, which I'm going to ask you guys to provide me with the endpoints of this interval. It's going to be a closed interval. And what should the left point of our interval be? Exactly right. Sri says it should be negative 2. Oh, I'm sorry. Mia said negative 2. Okay. Sorry. Man, my hearing is messed up. Okay. So it's negative 2. That's exactly right. And the reason is if we look at the x axis, negative 2 is to the left of 0. These are our two points. So if I, if I want to express this as an interval, then negative 2 goes on the left side. And the reason is because it shows up on the left on our x-axis. So negative 2 goes on that side, 0 goes on this side. So the average rate of change between x equals negative 2 and x equals 0 is 3 halves. OK, let's do the next one, which I'm going to write down here. So we want to do g of negative 2 minus g of negative 4. So g of negative 2 we already figured out. So I'm just going to take this thing right here. I know that's g of negative 2. And I'm going to plug it in down here. So I get negative 3 minus. Now what goes inside these parentheses should be g of negative 4. OK, so we're going to plug in negative 4. So we get 1 over 16. Negative 4 to the 4th power. Geez, why do they make me do that? That's going to be 16 squared. OK, here's how I know. 4 to the 4th equals 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. And that's equal to 16 times 16, which is equal to 16 squared. OK, so that's why I'm writing 16 squared here. I can cancel one power of 16. Okay, and now I can subtract 
x squared, which is 4 squared, negative 4 squared, which is going to be 16 again. So on the inside here, I get negative 3, or I'm sorry, on the inside of the parentheses, I get 16 minus 16. That's all going to cancel out to be 0. Okay, and on the bottom here, what are we going to have? Negative 2 minus negative 4. It's going to be negative 2 plus 4, which is positive 2. So we get negative 3 halves. My two x values are negative 2 and negative 4. So the interval here this time is going to be from negative 4 to negative 2. So this is the average rate of change on the interval negative 4 inclusive, negative 2 inclusive. Questions about problem 1 or problem 2? Yes, right. I didn't know uh, what goes in the brackets. OK, good question. So I'm talking about an interval here. So let's go back to the definition of this rate of change. So the rate of change is how quickly our function is moving around on average in a given set space, OK? So let me scroll down, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in a little bit more detail. So say I have some function here, and it looks like this. Well, if I look at the average rate of change between here and here, well, it looks like my function really went down a little bit, and then it went up a little bit. That all canceled out. So the average rate of change in this particular interval is going to be 0. All right. Now I can also talk about the average rate of change between here and, uh, well, let me use a different color, between uh, right here and right here. All right. So I started here, went up here. The average rate of change is the slope of this direct path between these two points. So the significance of these brackets is to describe which two points I'm using as my reference. Okay? And I describe these two points by their x values, x1 and x2. Okay. If you have more questions about that, um, I have office hours today, or I have MTC hours today, so you can stay after class and ask me some more questions about it. Okay. We're not going to do part B of this problem. We're going to move on to. Oh, geez, it's 10 already. OK. I better talk about average velocity, and we're going to come back to 4. OK, so average velocity. Who knows the equation for velocity? Anybody take high school physics? Well, how do I describe how fast I'm going in a car? Speed is what I'm looking for. Distance. Distance over time. That's exactly right. So in other words, miles per hour, right? If I think about miles, that's a unit of distance per, that means over, hour, unit of time. So V equals D over T. So we're going to write. Well, how are we going to write this? The average velocity is going to be the average rate of change in d of t, where d of t is the distance function. OK? So let me explain what I mean by that. If I had a distance function and I start at the origin, then that means I started at home. And I go up like this. That means that my distance was going up as time evolved. 
okay? And the velocity at which I'm moving away is going to be the rate at which my distance is changing. The rate at which my distance is changing in this graph is manifesting as the slope of this line. Okay, so the average velocity is going to be the average rate of change in d. However, what's going on in this graph is I'm just moving at a constant speed the entire time. Whereas usually when I'm driving a car, I might be varying speed. I'm driving in the neighborhood and then I'm driving on the highway and then I'm at a red light. Right? So the average rate of change is going to be the or the average velocity is going to be the average rate of change of the distance function where the distance function may not be a line. Okay? So the formula, if you want a compact formula for it, is going to be d of b minus d of a over b minus a. Okay? I'm just flipping which letters I'm using in my function. Okay? But it's the same form. So let's try problem number five. So Jacob's car, his speedometer is broken, but for some weird reason he's able to measure how far away he is from his house and it's plotted in this table here and we're asked to find Jacob's average velocity between the start of the trip and three minutes in okay so here we can see we have uh, we have t and distance is d of t okay so let's just use our formula we want to know in this case between the start of the trip and three minutes in. Now that tells us that what A and B are going to be. Okay, so our interval is going to be A comma B and those are going to be numbers which I'm going to ask you guys what's A going to be? Three, three or zero? I think it should be zero. The reason is, smaller number goes on the left. Bigger number goes on the right. So our interval is going to be from 0 to 3. So let's do d of b minus d of a. So we want d of 3 minus d of 0 all over 3 minus 0. Well, what's d of 3? 3,300. t is 3 means 3,300 is going to be our distance at that time. So we get 3,300 minus 0 over 3 minus 0 equals what? 1,100? I think it's 1,100. OK, we should give some units. Distance is given in feet, and time is given in minutes. So this is feet per minute. Okay, how about between d t equals 2 and t equals 3 minutes? Well, now our interval is going to be 2 comma 3. So we're going to have d of 3 minus d of 2 over 3 minus 2, which is just going to be something over 1. What's d of 3? Still 3,300. d of 2? 2,600. Okay, let's see if we can do some basic subtraction here. I think that's going to be... Uh, 400 plus 300, 700. Please let that be right. Can anybody verify for me? Pretty sure I did it right. Okay. Questions about problem number five. Average velocity is just average rate of change repackaged in a word problem. Okay? So velocity should pop up in your mind as a rate of change. How do you get yes. dollars in feet per minute or, or minute? I divided 3,300 by 3. Okay. Yeah, so I just, I just okay. simplified a little bit. This is equal to 3,300 divided by 3. Mm -hmm. And uh, I divided those things, and that's 1,100. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? Okay, move on. Seven. Got to keep an eye on my time here. All right, relative change. Okay. The way I want to describe relative change to you is 
by using percents, such as a sale percentage. So if I go to the store and there's a t-shirt that's $20 and they say it's 50% off, how much do I pay? $10, half of the price, right? 50% off means half the price. The way these problems are gonna work is they're gonna say, the t-shirt was $20, now it's $10. What is the percent off? And you would all say 50, okay? That's how these problems are gonna work. So the relative change, P, is gonna be given by, and this is a little bit of notation here, I'll explain it, P1 minus P0 divided by P0. That's also equal to delta P over P0. Okay, where delta, remember, means change in, okay? P1 and P0, respectively, mean P1 equals price at the end, and P0 means price at the beginning. Okay, so we're going to take the new price, subtract the old price, divide by the old price. Okay. This also works for any other kind of percent change problem. Okay, so in this case, in problem number six, our P is going to be a measure of how many subscribers this YouTuber has. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this problem. So P is the number of subs, okay, and let's see here. It says in January, we had 1.5 million subscribers, and today we have 2 million. So one of these should be P0, and one of them should be P1. What should P0 be? 1.5 mil. P1 should be 2 million. Okay. What is the relative change in the number of YouTube subscribers YouTuber X has between these two data points? We're just going to subtract these two things and divide by P0. So we get 2 mil minus 1.5 mil all over 1.5 mil. Oh, don't need an extra L there. And what do we get? 500K divided by 1.5 million. We can rewrite that as, let me rewrite it. Ignore what I just said about the K. Let me write 0.5 million, half a million. Okay. How many times does 0.5 go into 1.5? three times. So this is equal to one third. In other words, 33.3 repeating percent increase. Okay, just divided one by three. You can type it in on your calculator and get that. Okay, problem number seven. During the first week, the enrollment of Nina's business calc class changed from 130 to 162. Meanwhile, the enrollment of Cortex's business calc class dropped from 18 to 8. Which class had the higher relative change in magnitude? Okay, let's start with the first class, Nina. So we changed from 130 to 162. That means P0 is what? 130. P1 is 162. So Nina's rate of change, or excuse me, Nina's relative change, that's the word we use for this, is going to be 162 minus 130 over 130 equals 32 over 130. Now, when I say in magnitude, what I mean is take the absolute value of it. 
Well, the absolute value of a positive number is just that positive number, so we're all done. Now, let's look at Cortex's business calc class. We'll do it in purple. Okay, 18 to 8. What is P0? 18. And P1 is going to be equal to 8. Okay, notice the difference. First, Nina had an increase in students. Cortex had a decrease in students. Okay? So let's go ahead and do it. P1 minus P0, that's going to be 8 minus 18 over the original value is 18. So this is going to be 10 over 18. Now, if we want to find the magnitude, we got to take the absolute value, and this gives us Uh, not negative, it should be positive, 10 over 18. Okay, and these are the two numbers which we're supposed to compare. Okay, which of these two numbers do we think is bigger? R raise your hand if we think the pink number is bigger. What about the purple number? Okay, sweet. The purple number is bigger, okay? We can tell because 10 is more than half of 18. 10 is more than half of 18, but 32 is not more than half of 130. Half of 130 is like, I don't know, 70, no, 65? Yeah, okay. So this one's bigger. This is the larger rate of, I'm not, God, what am I talking about, rate of change? larger relative change. Parentheses in magnitude. Okay, so in magnitude just means in absolute value in this class. Any questions about uh, problem six and seven about relative change? Basically just, what is the sale percentage, what is the increase percentage, what is the decrease percentage, etc. Okay, concavity. Thankfully, I seem to be ahead of schedule and I'm making it through everything, so we'll have time to maybe go back. Concavity describes the direction in which a curve is bending. Now, let me describe what I mean. I'm going to divide the rest of this into two sections. On the left side, I'm going to have concave up. And on the right side, I'm going to have concave down. Concave up is something that looks like this or like this. Do you see how they're bending upwards? As we go from left to right, we're bending upwards, kind of like a U shape. Now, concave down is going to look the opposite way. It's going to be bending downwards. And I'm not kidding. This is literally how it's described in the book. It's just visually look at it. Does it look like it's bending up? If so, concave up. Does it, does it look like it's bending down? If so, it's concave down. Okay. There is a much more sophisticated way of explaining whether something's concave up or concave down, which we'll get to later on. It involves derivatives. Yes? Would you describe just the straight line and say that no Great question. The way I would describe a concave, a uh, straight line is no concavity. That's exactly right. So let me write that down here. Straight line, no concavity.
the way that I have described concavity is if, if we are bending upwards, that is what it means to be concave up. A straight line is not bending upwards and not bending downwards. So that's why I describe a straight line as having no concavity. Okay, so one way that I want to describe how to remember this is the following. If we write concave up versus concave down, this is what concave up looks like, and this is what concave down looks like. Okay, That's just a convenient way to remember which one is which. Okay. You feel okay about that? All right, let's try to do this part. So we want to describe for which pairs of consecutive points is the function increasing and concave up, okay? So we have two conditions that need to be met. We need our function to be going up and also bending up, okay? So what does that look like? This looks something like this, okay? Going up and bending up. So who wants to give me one pair of points where we see that? Yeah, D and E. D and E, between here and here. We're bending upwards and we're going upwards, okay? The way we'd, we would write it is D comma E. This should be a capital D. Capital D comma E. Okay, any other places where we're uh, increasing in concave up? E and F. What do we think? Do we agree with three? We're increasing. Are we concave up or concave down? Concave down on that part. Okay, so we meet one of the conditions, but not the other one. In fact, you just gave the answer to part B, right? Part B is asking, where are we increasing and concave down? Well, increasing and concave down looks something like this. We're going up, but we're bending downwards. Okay, so you're exactly right. That should be E comma F. Are there any other places where we are concave down but increasing? Yeah, A to B. Right here, we are increasing and bending downwards. So I'll just separate my two intervals by a comma, just like I would in a list of things. Okay, anywhere else? I think that's it. How about decreasing and concave up? Let's see, C and D, that's exactly right. So this is gonna look something like, we're going down but we're bending up, looks something like that. And the last one, by the way, is gonna look like decreasing and concave down, means we're going down and bending down. Okay, so decreasing and concave up, is that Yasmin who said that? Exactly right, it's gonna be, whoops, that's a B. It should be D comma E. Well, what am I talking about? Not D comma E. What did you say? C to D. <laughs> we already did D to E. Okay, this is gonna be a C comma D. Thank you. Okay, anywhere else where we're gonna be decreasing and concave up? F and G, what do we think about F and G? We're definitely decreasing. Are we concave up or are we concave down? Yeah. We're concave down at that part. So, again, one step ahead of us, you gave the answer to D, okay? So D, we are gonna have F to G, okay? Is there any other place where we are decreasing in concave down? Yeah, B to C, comma, B to C. Okay, I think we got everything, right? Let's see, we got A to B, we got B to C, we got C to D, D to E, D to F, F to G. All right, we got the whole thing. So we've completely categorized this thing. All right, 
Concavity is a really important topic that uh, is going to continue to to be really important for when we get to the more calculus stuff. It's going to tell us when when we're going to reach a maximum or when we're going to reach a minimum. Okay. It's also going to tell us. Well, that's basically that's the main reason that we're going to use it is to figure out where we have a maximum or where we have a minimum using the second derivative test. Okay. All right. Just for funsies, I put this on here. Which, by the way, this is not updated. Uh, based on the internal emails at USC and what I've been reading, we should be somewhere up here. <laughs> so, the question I have for you is, if I were to draw a curve of best fit, and maybe it looks something like this, do we think that's concave up or concave down? No. Concave up. So what does concave up really mean? Concave up means, yes, Kevin? Yes, not only are we increasing but the speed at which we are increasing is increasing. In other words, if I were in a car, I'm not just moving forward, I'm speeding up. I'm accelerating. So hopefully what we'd really like to see is something which looks like this. That's what we'd like to see. And a little preview for later in the class. This point right here where the concavity changes from being concave up to being concave down is called an inflection point. Okay, this is called an inflection point. And when we use mathematics to model things like diseases spreading in a community or population growth, etc., the inflection point is really important because it tells us a lot about where we're going to end up later on. So we hope to see an inflection point soon. Let's go back and do one or two of the problems that I skipped. So this is inflection point for which we desperately hope Okay, so let's see here. Let's go back, 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 back. We'll do problem number four here, okay? And uh, I'm going to erase some of this stuff here. Okay, so the problem states, the amount that Mary drives changes from week to week so that the amount she spends on gas each week also changes. However, she has calculated that over the last year she spent a total of $1,450 on gas. The question is, on average, how much does she spend on gas each week on average? Okay, so this is a rate of change. So first of all, allow me to describe our situation with a function, okay? The input is going to be time in weeks, and the output is going to be money spent on gas, okay? So I'm going to describe this as m of t, okay? Now let's try to express the information that we've been given here in terms of m and t. What they say is, after a year, we spent $1,450 on gas. So, in terms of a year, if t is measured in weeks, how long is one year? 52 weeks in one year. So, what, we, what this problem is really saying is m of 52 equals what? 1450. Okay, we want to find the average rate of change. So far, we've been given b and f of b. What about a and f of a? 
Can we infer what the other point is from the problem? I'd like to have something else of the form m of something equals something so that I can compare them. Kevin, you got an idea? Can this be m of zero is equal to zero? Exactly right. After zero weeks, how much have I spent on gas? Zero dollars. So on average, how much does she spend on each, each week on gas? Well, we're going to do m of 52 minus m of 0 divided by 52 minus 0 equals 14.50 over 52. Let me give you, I will give you very specific directions on a test based on how much work I'd like you to show. Okay, that's what I'll say. Um, there will be problems where because of the nature of the take home test, I'll be forced to maybe ask you for more work than I would typically uh, require on an in-person exam. So let me defer your question until I write an exam and I'll be, I'll make sure to be very clear about it. Okay, if nothing major changes, so this is our rate of average rate of change, which is the average amount of money that we spend each week on gas. Okay, if nothing major changes, how much should Mary budget for gas for the next three weeks? Well, this is the amount of gas this is the amount of gas we expect uh, well, this is the amount of money, really, money. We expect to spend on gas in one week. So if I want to find out the amount of money that I think I'm going to spend on gas for the next three weeks, I should take this number and do what? Multiply by three. That's going to be our answer. Okay. All right. So that was problem number four. It's 1029. So we can go ahead and stop there. Let me just really quickly, before you guys pack up, announce I have Math Tutoring Center office hours today. Okay. So I'm going to go over to my office where I'm going to connect to the Blackboard session. Okay. And if you guys connect to the session, which I'm going to email a link to you for, you guys can come and ask questions and whatnot, etc. Okay, that's all I have. Oh, one last announcement. Forgot. Uh, Aaron wanted me to tell you guys, session on Sunday at 8 o'clock if you want to connect to the Blackboard. That's all. Yes, a link will be sent for every session. My office hours today are from 12, no, are from 11 until 1. Okay, and I was, it's like, it's not in person at all, like you have to do it online? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'll, uh...